So today I'm going to um, cover living well, being well, the natural approach to women's health and try to um, uh, cover the issues that pertain to, to women's health in particular. So by all surface measurements, um, this era should be one of the healthiest on record. Our access to information is through the roof. Most of us know where the nearest whole food store is, where the nearest health food store is, gyms, our trainers, fitness experts are our best friends. We no longer have it as an annual resolution. We collectively follow every thought that our experts share on social media feeds. We are learning more and attempting more to live a healthy lifestyle. However, we're in a healthcare crisis. Not because of money, but because of intent and philosophy. We must end the thinking that health is the absence of disease. That's like believing that divorce is what creates a healthy relationship. According to Dr. Guy Reekman, who's the Chancellor of Life University, health flows from the inside out. So what modern, so what modern um, health has accomplished is minimizing infectious, infectious disease. However, it has lacked in the pursuit of health itself. We're reactively managing disease instead of proactively controlling and promoting our health. We have lost sight of what it means to thrive. So using synthetic drugs and surgery to treat health conditions was known for you know, many decades um, as just medicine, simply medicine. That's how we practice medicine. Today, this system is referred to as conventional medicine. So this is the kind of medicine that all of us experience when we go into a hospital, when we go to a clinic. And it's often both expensive and invasive. And it's, it's really good at some types of things. So handling of emergency, um, conditions such as a massive injury or life-threatening disease. So if I get in a car accident or if I suffer from a heart attack, I want to be taken to the best emergency room in the city, in the country. Uh, and um, so conventional medicine is, is good in, in, in certain circumstances. It's not all bad. Uh, and some of it is scientifically validated, some of it is not. So any therapy that is typically excluded from conventional medicine, we refer to as alternative medicine. And it's, a quite, it's kind of a catch-all term. Um, and it refers to hundreds of old and new practices, ranging from acupuncture to homeopathy. So generally, alternative therapies are closer to nature. They're non-invasive. They're cheaper, or less invasive, I shouldn't say you know, completely non-invasive, um, than conventional therapies. And although um, there are some exceptions, some alternative therapies are um, you know, scientifically validated, and some are not, the same as we have in conventional medicine. And the third category is complementary medicine, and that is um, an alternative medicine practice that is used in conjunction with conventional medicine. So, for example, um, when we use ginger syrup to prevent nausea uh, for a patient who's undergoing chemotherapy, that's referred to as complementary medicine. So what is integrative medicine then? Integrative medicine is healing-oriented, and it should take into account the whole person, body, mind, and spirit including all aspects of our lifestyles. It emphasizes the therapeutic relationship and makes use of all appropriate therapies, both conventional and alternative. So according to the National Cancer Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine at the National Institutes of Health, integrative medicine combines mainstream medical therapies and complementary and alter alternative therapies for which there is some high quality scientific evidence of safety and effectiveness. And the principles that guide uh, integrative medicine are that it's a partnership. Imagine that, a partnership between the patient and the practitioner in the healing process. It's the appropriate use of conventional and alternative methods to facilitate the body's natural healing 
innate healing process or response. It considers all factors that influence health, wellness, and disease, including mind, spirit, and community, as well as the body. It's a philosophy that neither rejects conventional medicine nor accepts alternative therapies with, uh, uncritically, without criticism. So it's the recognition that good medicine should be based in good science. Now there's a novel concept when we look at a lot of the products that are out in our industry. Um, it should also be inquiry driven and be open to new paradigms. The use of natural, effective, less invasive interventions whenever we can. Sometimes we can do that, sometimes we can't, and we need to be, take all of that into consideration. Use of the broader concepts of promotion of health and the prevention of illness, as well as the treatment of disease. And we need to train our practitioners to be models of health and healing, committed to the process of self-exploration and self-development. So in other words, Integrative medicine really cherry picks the, the very best scientifically validated therapies from both conventional and complementary alternative medicine systems. Dr. Abraham Verghese, in his New York Times review of Dr. Weil's book on healthy aging, summed it up really well. He said, Dr. Weil doesn't seem wedded to any particular dogma, Western or Eastern, only to get the best, the patient, the best philosophy. And I think that's extremely important. That really sums it up. So what does health look like in the 21st century? According to a um, Google survey on what consumers are looking for or are looking to do with supplements and what the latest product trends are, Consumers are active participants in the care of their health. They're not passive. And 5% of all Google searches are health related. So we have a population and a consumer that's very interested in their health. And what's our role as women in, in health? Traditionally, we've, we're responsible for the health of the whole family. So we make nutritional decisions every day for our families. We make intervention decisions every day for our families. We make supplementation decisions. And we're different um, in how we process information, how we go about um, our, that role than, than men in, in that. So when a, when a man has a certain condition, they go to a doctor, they want to know what's wrong, and they want to know how to fix it. We're different. We want to understand what's actually going on. We want to know why, why is it me? Why am I sick? Why is my child sick? Why is this happening? What are, what are my options? What are my options for me, for my child, for my husband, for, my, for what is going on? And what are the consequences of those options? And they want to be, we want to be involved in the decision making. We don't want someone to just give us a prescription and say, this is what you got, take it and go home, don't ask me questions. We want to be involved in the decision making. We want to understand and discuss those, um, those decisions and those solutions. And we want to feel good about those decisions. Now that doesn't bode well with a visit to our family doctor that normally takes less than 15 minutes. So traditionally, or you know, and uh, historically, the old dogma has been that we get everything we need out of a healthy diet. If we ate a well-balanced diet, we're going to get all of our nutrients, all of our vitamins, everything we need. We don't need to do anything else. And I know that, you know, I've gone to family physicians who have told me that. I have, you know, doctors and healthcare practitioners that are friends that we've had this discussion for a long time. Things have changed and are changing. But that's been traditionally the thought, that if you're spending money on supplementation and on vitamins on, and on those types of things for health, you're really investing in expensive urine because your body can only absorb, I'm sure all of you have heard that too, at some point or another. Um, you, you know, your body can only absorb so much and, and you, know, you get all of that from your food. Well, theoretically, that's true. 
but in reality it's not. And I'm going to show you the data that, that tells you otherwise. We live in a world that's full of stress, environmental pollution, soil depletion, our water is depleted, there's, we eat foods that have been, that, that have pesticides used on them, we have grain fed meats and dairy that's full of toxins and xenoestrogens. So that's not the reality that, that we're dealing with. And in a report by Dr. Tarona Lodog, who is um, to the Congressional Dietary Supplement Caucus, this is data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, revealed that 90 million people suffer, and this is the North American population, suffer from vitamin D deficiency. 30 million suffer from deficiency in vitamin B6, 18 million from vitamin B12, 60 million from vitamin, B, for vitamin C, and there's 48% of the U.S. population that consumes less than the required amount of daily magnesium. So, you know, the reality and the data proves otherwise, that we aren't getting everything we need from our diets. So B vitamins, why do we need B vitamins? They're important for metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. They play a vital role in production of fuel and energy. They taken together in balanced amounts. Um, there's eight B vitamins that partner together. And low B6 and B12 uh, puts you at risk for depression and has an impact on cognition, attention, and memory. And a subset of women who take birth control pills also have low vitamin B6. Two thirds of those with B12 deficiency are over the age of 40. There's vitamin B6, we've got 30 million people that are deficient, less than 20 nanomoles per liter. Women are twice as likely to be deficient in B6 as men. The study from Tufts University in 2012 found that as B6 levels falls, inflammation in the body rises. And we know that inflammation is associated with so many diseases in our body, such as cardiovascular risk and cancer. Um, so, you know, it's really important. That, that we have this. Even marginally low levels, so between 20 to 30 nanomoles per liter, increase the risk of cardiovascular disease and stroke. And there's been meta-analysis of 13 studies that found B6 is inversely correlated with reduction of colorectal cancer. And what does it take if we were to eat a well-balanced diet to get B vitamins from our diet? So to get enough, to get 1.5 milligrams of B6 from our food, um, this is what you would have to, to be consuming, one of these things a day. So 2.5 bananas, um, salmon, three cups of diced out of, raw diced out avocado, three cups of sweet potatoes. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, I may eat that once in a while, but I don't eat that every day. Vitamin B12, we've got 18 million Americans that are deficient in, in vitamin B12. And it plays a key role in DNA synthesis, hematopoiesis, and neurological function. And the risk for deficiency is inadequate intake, impaired absorption, if you're a vegan, if you're on certain medication, obesity, elders, and alcoholism are, are some of the things that could um, affect that. Riboflavin, or B2. Girls with iron deficiency are at risk for low dietary intake. This is crucial for absorption and use of iron. Its primary source in the Western diet is dairy and fortified foods. And in the UK, it was found that 95% of teenage girls had low riboflavin levels. A five-year study in China found strong correlation between low riboflavin and iron deficiency anemia. And this graph here shows us um, the effect of metformin, which is a drug that is used in type 2 diabetes on depletion of the vitamin B12. And many, many medications actually interfere with nutrient absorption. And this is one example. So this is a metformin group here, and this is a placebo group that's not on, on that in this, in this study. And you can see the difference in, in the absorption. 
So there's been a meta-analysis of 29 studies, over 8,000 patients that found 245% increased risk of B12 defici deficiency that's associated with metformin use and um, proton uh, inhibitors, proton pump inhibitors, which are used for ulcers um, and GERD type of, type of patients. Folate, I think all of us know the importance of folate um, and folate supplementation. Um, it should be given two to three months before pregnancy. And through fortification in the U.S., there's, you know, there's less than 130 milligrams per day, which making supplementation crucial. So given that many women are avoiding gluten containing foods, the contribution from foods um, is likely even lower. Iron, the World Health Organization says that iron deficiency is the most common nutrient deficiency in the world. It affects two billion people. Iron deficiency anemia accounts for 20% of all global maternal deaths. It's necessary for growth and development an essential component of hemoglobin. Meta-analysis has found that iron supplementation improved attention, concentration, and IQ. So iron deficiency increases the risk of lead toxicity as well. And what do we need to eat to get 18 milligrams of iron in our food? Again, I don't know how many people have 45 ounces <laughs> of chicken or even liver, not many people like liver, um, or three cups of lentils. This is per day that you would have to have one of these. So again, it's not, it's not practical and it's not um, likely that we're getting this from our food. Vitamin C. We've got 15.7 million Americans that have a vitamin C deficiency. And I'm sorry that I keep saying Americans, that's the data that's, um, that's mostly out there, is, but it is very um, representative of the North American population, which Canadians, is, is very similar to, to, what we, um, to what we see. So it plays a role in activating folic acid, and vitamin C levels decline rapidly during periods of emotional and physical stress and illness. And as the levels fall, collagen synthesis is impaired. So we bruise more easily. Our skin becomes thick and dry. Wounds take longer to heal. Joints hurt. We get tired. Zinc is another, is another component that plays a crucial role in our immune response. We need zinc to activate our immune cells that are responsible for destroying cells infected with viruses or bacteria or cancerous cells. And marginal zinc deficiency can also diminish the activity of other important immune cells. The World Health Organization again estimates that marginal zinc status results in the deaths of over 780,000 children under the age of five every year from diarrheal diseases, pneumonia, and malaria. And it's not effectively stored, so we must continuously replace it in the diet. Omega-3 fatty acids, we all know um, that these are important. I think you know, there's been enough out in the media about the importance of omega-3s, and they are vital in pregnancy and during the five years of life. Um, crucial for brain health, eyes, heart, muscles, skin, and nerves. And we as a, as a society don't eat a lot of fish. That's you know, where you normally get a lot of omega-3s. So it's really important to supplement with omega-3. Vitamin D. I had said earlier on in my slide that there was 90 million people that have vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D is crucial. It interacts with more than a thousand genes. And women are at highest risk. Women, non-Hispanic blacks, are at highest risk. And review of 30 studies show that high vitamin D status is strongly associated with better breast cancer survival. So there's many benefits um, to vitamin D, and especially living where we live, um, we don't get a lot of sunlight, uh, especially during the winter months. The days are shorter. Our body, we're not out in the sun as, as much, so we, you know, we don't produce enough vitamin D, and we should make sure that we, we test our vitamin D levels and that we supplement with vitamin D. And even in the summer, I mean, you know, we wear a lot of sunscreen, so we have to keep that in mind as well. And to get the recommended um, you know, dosage for vitamin D, again, you, 
have to eat tuna, salmon, um, or 26 oil packed sardines. I don't know when the last time I had a sardine. <laughs> 15 large eggs. So you can see, you know, again, that's not very practical. Calcium and PMS. There's been two systemic reviews of PMS treatments conducted that there is sufficient evidence to recommend calcium for PMS. And many women, especially adolescents, do not meet the adequate intake recommendations for dietary calcium. Drug-induced osteoporosis. It's responsible for one to five cases of osteoporosis. Aromatase inhibitors, um, such as those taken, uh, used for breast cancer. Anti-androgen therapy that's used for prostate cancer. Proton pump inhibitors that are used for, for heartburns. All of these affect um, osteoporosis. Magnesium in the heart. There's a nurse's study um, that found that was in over 88,000 people, 88,000 women, that found for every 0.25 milligrams per deciliter increment in plasma magnesium, there's a 41% lower of sudden cardiac death, lower risk of sudden cardiac death. Women with the lowest levels of magnesium also had significantly increased risk of stroke. So low magnesium intakes and low blood levels have been associated with type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, elevated C-reactive protein, hypertension, atherosclerosis, sudden cardiac death, osteoporosis, migraine headaches, asthma, colon cancer, um, and this is from this large study. And review of 44 studies shows that magnesium supplements enhance blood pressure lowering effect of blood pressure medication if you're already on blood pressure medication for stage one hypertension. So that's something you know, important to keep in mind. Again, that gives you an idea of you know, what we would have to eat in order for us to get 400 milligrams of magnesium. So in 2010, um, we've got data that shows there's more than 118 million prescriptions for proton pump inhibitors, which roughly has you know, 11 billion in sales, represents about 11 billion in sales. And they deplete nutrients. They deplete nutrients like magnesium, iron, calcium, vitamin B12, folic acid, zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D. And we all, you know, just heard how important all of those are to our overall health. And these are some, of, some other drugs that also deplete nutrients. And um, these are used in, um, for depression, antidepressants. And as you can see, that women are prescribed you know, the most of these drugs and they deplete a lot of nutrients. They deplete B12, B2, and vitamin E. So we have to keep that in mind while, while we're on those kind of treatments as well. So which brings me to this slide, proof of probable harm in the absence of intervention. So Dr. Heaney, um, put out this paper in 2011 and it's a um, you know, really, really important concept that has taken a while to catch on. The absence of medicines will not produce disease. If we don't take a medicine, that's not going to cause us from you know, getting a disease. But if we, the absence of those nutrients will cause a disease, will result in disease. So given the high prevalence of nutrient deficiency that I've just mentioned in North America, a high proportion of the population is in a pre-disease state. And in the absence of getting the, the required amounts of those nutrients, and whether you know, we were establishing we're not really getting it from food, so if we don't supplement and look at that, um, we are going to progress towards a disease state, which establishes a proof of probable harm. So it's a different way to look at it. So supplementation is vital to prevent progression to a disease state. And this fact can't be sidestepped because the question with nutrients isn't always whether I should use them or not, it's how much do I need. And we need to have a holistic view of our health. Yes, it's easy to say, you know, I'm predisposed to diabetes because it's in my genes. 
my parents had it, my grandparents had it, I'm predisposed to cardiovascular disease or to breast cancer, and we know that. We know that you know, genes play a role. But we, we also need to keep in mind and also understand is that how we live and what we eat and what we do every day can activate either those healthy genes and silence the disease genes or the other way around. So we need to be very conscious of you know, choosing to, to live a healthy lifestyle and what we do every day. And we need to take a look at the philosophy of wellness. We need to look towards studying the role of nutrition in bolstering health in its entirety by creating a new set of tools and indices that will let us measure health. And this is really important for regulators. So a lot of companies come to us. We at KGK do clinical trials, conduct clinical trials on behalf of companies to substantiate um, their claims that they're making on their products that they put on the shelf. So a lot of the nutritional supplements that you see on the shelf, um, you know, if they have a claim behind them, they would have required to have a study done that shows you know, that what they're saying on that, on that label is actually true. And companies like ours provide that service. So we've been around for over 20 years providing that service. And we have been, um, a lot of our clients actually come from the US and the regulations in the US are a little different than Canada. And our scientist, Dr. Evans, who's here in the audience, has actually um, been invited by the FDA to come and speak to their, um, to their reviewers on how do you design studies for nutrition. Nutrition is a lot more complicated than medicine. So when we design a study for nutrition, we have to think about you know, many different factors. You know, there isn't an, a true placebo group. We can't deplete these nutrients from, from our body in order for us to, to have a true placebo group. Whereas in a drug study, if you're doing you know, a study for Tylenol, your body doesn't produce Tylenol. So you can give Tylenol or, or placebo and it either takes away your headache or it doesn't. And it's, it's much simpler than when we do a study for gut health or cognition or women's health and we have to take into consideration of, you know, what are they getting from the diet. And we are looking for an effect over and above that what they're getting from their diets and to, to show a difference between that and placebo. So they're much more complicated and you know regulators like the FDA, we've been, we've been speaking with them about um, shifting their mindset and looking at health instead of disease because they look at, uh, they want us to go by the same rules when we're designing these as there are for, for disease and to look at markers of disease. So we've been very active um, in that area. And Dr. Lodog um, said, you know, once you've developed the ability to understand people, to understand their beliefs, where they come from, why they think the way that they do, and if you can honor that, you can learn any medicine, including integrative medicine. And I think, you know, I'd like to leave you with that today, that we take that philosophy and that approach into every aspect um, of what we do in our research at KJK. Thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the t research team at uh, KGK Science who prepared this presentation, especially Dr. Evans and Dr. Iyer, who worked very hard to prepare this presentation for me to give today. Thank you. And I'll take any questions. Yes. Like the little boy eating the hot dog that was full of vitamins. Yes. So what about a multivitamin? Depends on the multivitamin. It depends on, you know, it's, that's great. You should definitely be on a multivitamin. Um, but it depends, you know, on the levels that are in that multi, uh, multivitamin and um, if that's adequate for you. You should probably have, um, you know, a test done to see what your levels are and discuss that with your healthcare practitioner. So definitely a multivitamin, I would say. Probiotics are, you know, excellent to take every day for our overall health. Um, uh, Omega-3s, you don't get that in a multivitamin, that would be separate. Um, these are some of the things that, you know, I take every day. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. I just 
want to say how much I appreciate KGK. It's made a big difference in my life. I've made some new acquaintances and friends there, and your staff is amazing. I am excited to be part one of your participants in your studies. And I've been there for years now, and I'll continue to come. Thank you so much. Thank you.